This video is a documentation of my Modern History of Architecture 2 report, which was a class in college in uh, April uh, 22nd, 1996, titled Aero Saarinen, the Kresge Chapel at the Massachusetts Institution of Technology. The quotes on the cover are, No less than religion at its best, architecture at its best, is witness and custodian to the spirit of modern man. And that's by Pietro Belushi, who did a the Kodesh Synagogue which I have not been to. The other quote is, A brick wall didn't realize how beautiful it was until it was touched by sunlight. And that's Louis Kahn, who was a professor of my father at the University of Pennsylvania, as well as a famous architect. So, Eero Saarinen, of course, is most famous for his airport, the... Aero Saarinen Dulles Airport here in the DC area and uh, that's one of his sculptures there I think that is the sculpture on top that serves as the steeple of the Kresge Chapel which I did visit uh, during the writing of this report and I was at Roger Williams Rich White University, actually. It's uh, the uh, Roger Williams University. Aero Saarinen's Interdenomin Interdenominational Kresge Chapel at MIT, Boston. While taking a leisurely stroll through the seemingly haphazard campus of MIT, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, I came upon a sweet and blissfully rotund form that was clearly composed of masonry brick set in a common bond. Its cylindrical form appeared pure and abstractly severe from afar. Closer inspection revealed a more intricate reality. The surface was roughly textured by randomly protruded bricks, and a series of low arches of random size formed its base, but were backed by a secondary interior wall. The base was set into a shallow pit filled with water and ringed with a rim of concrete. The chapel's massing was as conservative as your basic cylinder, but sharp. The sharp alien bell tower, which elegantly crowned it, was comparable to a beacon or antennae. Antenna, like a holy lance piercing the sky. And this is a sketch that I did. In relation to the other neighboring structures on campus, the brick construct or construction was petite. The Kresge Chapel marked itself as a part of the MIT campus that was distinguished by having a remote location many yards from its neighbors. And thus respectfully dif differentiating its functionality while remaining part of the whole, despite its blatant differences denoted by its particular scale and multidimensional expression of form. Uh, my instructor put a question mark there, wondering what I meant by multidimensional. It seems out of time and place. It seems abstracted, and abstracted forms 
seem alien in their pureness. It has made it's made its own statement without being an eyesore or fighting the more conventional style of buildings which surrounds it. In fact, the tr traditional brick that was used matched that of the surrounding dorms. Across the lawn from the Kriski Chapel is another of Aero Saarinen's buildings, the Auditorium. Both were built from 1950 to 1955. This building was much larger than the chapel, and actually I think there's, I have a uh, correction there to make, that the auditorium, I believe, was made by a, um, a Slavic uh, engineer who my father knew as well. So I think I, uh, I, I might put a footnote in the uh, details about this, but anyway, um, I, I did visit both. Uh, the building was much larger and completely different in style, appearance, atmosphere, and building materials. The narthex, a rectangular hallway encased in black glass, was attached to the chapel from behind, like an arm extended to connect the auxiliary rooms to the primary cylinder. I say that the hall was located in the back of the cylinder because of my interpretation of the site orientation. <laughs> The front of the chapel being the side facing the auditorium, and the back was directed towards the alley. The structure of the back hall was comprised of dark gray, thin, repetitive, vertical steel members. Each section of black glass was then further subdivided by smaller horizontal muntins spaced unevenly from inches apart to feet apart. On either side of the black rectangle, on the end furthest from the main cylinder, there were doors of entry. They were double doors on each side of the hall, opposite each other and made of solid pine with metal knockers as handles that open outward and together. It made for a fine contrast between the bright pine doors and the sleek, black, enigmatic, repetitious hallway. Above the doors were four conic lights with their tops cut off. I reached for the door handles with no sense of what to expect within. I entered. The interior of the hallway was transparent to the outside with only a faintly darkened tint my natural but false assumption that a dark structure with no direct openings for light makes for an even darker interior was shattered. The narthex was very generously lighted on the inside, and I felt very safe. Flower baskets were placed on either side along the hall. They're not really architectural elements. Okay, that's what my professor said. I turned to look down the glass hallway of adequate human proportions and saw a beautiful white marble altar with shimmering gold strands behind it. The richly tiled floor led me to the double height space. All in one breath I was taken into the space and in one breath I took it all in. Beautiful organ music began playing. It was coming from within that sacred vault, and yet I could see no one, not even an organ. The tones undeniably complemented the space, and light poured in from an oculus directly above the altar and complemented the golden screen. It was as if I were in a subterranean realm, with no views, no direct view, to the outside world, but only washes of light on heavy earthen walls. It was small for most churches and intimate. I was not scared, nor did I feel trapped. The professor asked, why would you feel those things? 
Well, it is a somewhat claustrophobic space, but I'm not that claustrophobic. So some people do feel a little confined when they don't have windows. But I felt safe. It was as though I had been worming my way through the claustrophobic labyrinths of Moria, and at last had come to the inner sanctum. I had risen from the catacombs and been rewarded with the gift of space, generous and conducive to individual prayer. And that is a sketch of the altar with uh, a shimmering uh, mobile, or uh, I think, uh, with, down from the oculus. And I think this is looking up into the oculus. I felt like an archaeologist has, after they have broken the seals on a tomb, broken the barrier, rolled away the stone, and breathed air that has been undisturbed for thousands upon thousands of years. Spiritual fervor of the ancients presented to me by the gods on my own terms. I had come there, I had made the journey, but never had I dreamt of finding such a meditational and self-cleansing sanctuary. The white altar, naked and vulnerable before me, swooned me with its innocence and made me slave to its purpose, whatever that may be. It was a temple complete with secret stairs behind the altar, and I would have willingly been its sacrifice. The professor thought that this poetic language was perhaps not so appropriate to an architectural analysis. Well, it seems my professor had not read, or at least not remembered, the writings of Richard Morris or uh, Pugin <laughs> or any of the Romanticists. Uh, during the arts and crafts period of Victorian revivals. Oh well. There were three walls of the Kresge Chapel itself. The outer wall had the low arches, which allowed light to reflect off the water in the moat and up into the inner chamber. The inner wall undulated like a frozen wave, and the lower wall followed its example. In the daylight, the textured brickwork was highlighted by the exterior light wells. The floor could fit a congregation of 130 people, and as I turned in circles to experience the space, I saw the pipe organ located above the entryway. A student had their back to me, intent on playing the instrument. Mass was about to begin. Criticism of Saarinen was commonplace in a time when cons consistency of style and stylistic development were expected. Aero Saarinen's unpredictability and bold diversity irritated and even enraged his critics. Each new project was so vastly different from the others before it. How could they even judge his progress? As Philip Johnson put it, Arrow was altogether unpredictable. Had he lived longer, he would have influenced everybody and all of us. Arrow Saarinen once said that he began his projects with basic considerations of the particular job. And his father was, of course, a famous architect artist who founded a colony of artists, or uh, Cranbrook Institute. Aero Saarinen also respected the spirit, the client, the expression of the program, and the site with its surroundings. To Aero, the surroundings were much more than just landscape. They were both man-made and natural nature. He analyzed his own project of the Kresge Auditorium Chapel as being too egocentric. The critics neglect the area which needs desperate... Let's see. Oh, he, he said... Too, too, this, this is a quote. Too egocentric. They, and, and, you know, 
my professor asks, who's they? Neglect the area which desperately needs unity. I expect he meant the clients. Who else would he be talking about? He wasn't the only critic that felt this, and in fact, I agree with him. However, my analysis is only of the chapel and not the auditorium. I feel that the chapel needed to be removed, if not secluded, because that is the main purpose of going to a spiritual place. The chapel is like a clearing in the woods, which is a perfectly justifiable place of worship and peace. Even the curvature of the walls increases the sense of turning inward. I believe he was perfectly successful in its, in its design. He also admitted that the connection of the narthex and the chapel was clumsily executed. As architectural record uh, lighting said, the Kresge Chapel is all about light, drama, and interior serenity, which I believe is exactly what the project called for, nothing more, nothing less. So, you know, what is the connection between the, the narthex and the chapel a problem with the, uh, about, about light? Uh, I don't think it's a big deal details. I think it, it, it turned out fine. Saarinen's Kresge Chapel has been compared to and analyzed as a brilliant assimilation of the essence of a mosque, a Christian chapel, and a synagogue. But it doesn't have the elements that required for Muslim religious requirements. Okay, maybe so. Uh, their their roles as uh, spiritual containers of light, but you know basically a sacred uh, inner inner sanctum is is pretty universal. I chose Aero Saarinen's chapel because I first became interested in him as a child when my dad told me that Saarinen designed Dulles Airport and the TWA terminal at JFK, the JFK airport. Every building of his that I've ever seen has blown my mind with its expressiveness and unearthly beauty. Also during first year studio, my professor introduced me to Saarinen's MIT chapel. I used a technique similar to that of the chapel for having light filter in around the edges of my floor between it and the wall from an outside moat in my design. By abstracting the chapel's form, Saarinen also abstracted the specific interpretations of religion and spiritual practice. In turn, the shape and form of the chapel was derived from basic spiritual instincts. Eero Saarinen was deeply inspired by one of his travels as a student. He recalls how he sat in a mountain village in Sparta, Greece with bright moonlight overhead and a secondary light around the horizon, soft and hushed. And there is a sketch showing light. Here is a floor plan sketch that I drew. showing the circle with the rectangle and here is the cylinder or uh, you know actually two rectangular volumes but it is a section of the building and the inner wall sketch and below it is the moat you can see the the light how the light well works. And the bibliography. Thanks for listening and
I am so glad to be done with college.